Hello and uh, welcome to the uh, webcast. We're uh, delighted today and uh, look forward to uh, having a discussion on in the 20th century. So our uh, today. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is that we've got technical issues. I think. Audio. Hand over and you, if that's okay, just fix those. And uh, 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 hand over to Andrew, uh, and he's going to speak to you now about uh, making a board around, around digital. Andrew. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, so we were going to have it that Chris was going to give the big picture, and then I was going to move on to the detail of what happens at the board we perhaps do it the other way around while we fix chris's technical problem um i'll talk about the work at the board level and then chris will look at the, at the bigger picture so if i may um first of all introduce the the idea of why it is that i've been dealing with this um it's in the context of work i've been doing on judgment managerial judgment and for me therefore the question of how one deals with digital issues on the board is an aspect of operating uh, the exercise of judgment on the board. This is something critical we know to everybody who's involved on at a board level, the chairman who has the responsibility for what goes on, and the members who have to look at the proposals and say, all right, so what do we think about these as far as governance is concerned? Are we prepared to say yes or no, or to ask further questions when uh, proposals come up on the digital side. Um, let me start off with some slides, if I may. Uh, now these, this is Chris's, so we'll start off with this one. Um, my focus is on judgment in the digital decisions, and in doing so, I'll start with something very physical, not digital at all. Um, some of you will be familiar with the picture on the left-hand side, which is the Miranda Bridge in Genoa, which collapsed about two and a half years ago. Now, I'm using this for a specific reason. Here is a very tangible element. It's unlike digital, as it were, we can see it. We can see a bridge has fallen down. And below, you'll see the four causes, arguably, about why the bridge fell down. Um, and they, they are four elements of failures of judgment at, at various stages. Happily, the second picture is of the reconstructed Morendi Bridge, which opened in, uh, in August this year. Um, and the last two pictures are the pictures of a bridge which suffered from the same problems as this bridge in Genoa, but actually they were fixed beforehand, and therefore the bridge did not collapse. Um, many of you on this call will be familiar with this bridge, even though you may not may not recognize it because you've probably traveled over it. If you travel from the airport, Heathrow Airport, into central London, you travel over this bridge. The last picture is the way in which this was fixed. It was simply by reinforcing struts outside the concrete. Um, so this is an example of something which is a complex decision, but it's very tangible. And why we know a lot about this is because here is a failure. A lot of the judgments we make are less tangible than this. And of course, we are as interested in success as we are in failure. And as far as I'm concerned, therefore, my work on judgment is very much about trying to ensure success, not just avoiding failure. Let me explain what I mean by judgment. I've used this word several times already. This is about the way in which we combine the personal qualities we have with our relevant knowledge and experience to form opinions and take decisions. So as far as I'm concerned, this is the judgment call that we make every day, many times a day, and which is critical, obviously, to the operation of the board. So what is judgment? Um, the work that I've been doing in the last two or three years has been to try and pin down this difficult element. And if this is a, a sort of busy slide, 
I will give you a reference at the end of where you can see more about this framework and how it's constructed and the work that I did on putting it together. But briefly, judgment is about what you take in, both in terms of reading and listening. It's about who and what you trust in terms of the source of information which you've got, the people again, and the material. It's about what you know about this particular element. And in the case of, if we look at digital decisions, most of us don't know very much about this. And that, of course, is why digital decisions are such a vulnerable element for any board. Number four is one's feelings and beliefs. And many of us approach these kinds of decisions with existing biases. We have biases, we have feelings about things. The way we make the choice, in the case of the board, it's on the basis of the board papers, plus the briefing usually. And then finally, it's the ability to deliver. So six stages of judgment um, that I've discussed in my wider work on this, on this subject. And I want to refer to this framework in the context of, so what do we do when we make a decision on the bay on it? substantial digital project. These are the six questions that I'll be talking about. Just a couple of things before I go into them. First of all, I'm not saying here that judgment is the only element that we've got in our decision making. Of course, there are many other elements that go into it, the qualities we bring, all, all kinds. And also, I just wanted to say that um, you know, well, I've talked about qualities here. So what do I mean by qualities? Um, it's, our, it's the insights we bring, the intelligence, the reason, these many personal qualities that those of us who are used to operating at boards know are immensely valuable at a board level. Um, again, I'm happy to answer questions about this as we, as we go through, so please don't hesitate. But just focus on those six questions um, in relation to the digital decisions that come up at the board. So in the first case, in terms of listening we do and the, re and the reading we do, in terms yes. of have we actually understood what it is that's coming to the board? And most of us probably have not dealt in detail with a major digital project. This is new to us. And so we listen and read, not as experts, but as people who have to rely on experts. And my, you know, my observation in terms of the way this works usually is that if one gets a paper on, on a big digital project at the board, the temptation is to start at the end and work backwards, if you like, to say, all right, so what is it that's being proposed? Now, let me look at the reason that's gone into this. The difficulty, if one leaves it until, especially if it's a complex project, the difficulty is that that's quite late to be asking very detailed questions. So the first suggestion I've got uh, under this heading is that it is worth discussing this in often in more in detail, sometimes much more detail, before it comes to the board. That's to say, to clarify what it is one knows and doesn't know with the authors of the paper. It may be that the board itself, if it's going to be a really path-breaking path -breaking project, is going to have to consider this perhaps in subcommittee and the subcommittee reporting to the board. Um, the second um, thing to perhaps is that when we are at the board table, looking at the papers, many of us will not understand everything that is in these papers. And clearly, therefore, there's a judgment call about how much detail one goes into in considering this project. Um, and, but it does seem to me that one has to be very clear in one's own mind what it is what, that one does and doesn't understand and how crucial this is 
to agreeing or not agreeing a project to go ahead. Um, I do feel that it's tempting for many people to feel, oh, I don't want to look ignorant. We know that phenomenon at the board. And I, this is one among many occasions where it seems to me that uh, board members should be upfront with themselves and others saying, look, I don't understand this and this about the paper. What matters, of course, is not the one that should understand all the technical detail, but one should understand what is critical to take in the decision. Okay, let me go on to number two, um, which is about trust. Here we've got the question of do we trust the people making the presentation? What about their track record? You know, how good have they been in the past? What do we make of the staff? What do we make of our colleagues' ability to understand this particular issue? Often on boards, you have one person, maybe two people who know more about this. And again, it's a question of how far one trusts them. Um, so in terms of trust, therefore, my sense is that we need to be conscious of what we feel about the strengths and weaknesses of those on whom we're going to rely to take us through this project in terms of the, the, the major elements in it. Now, track record, I've suggested, is one element, but it's not the only, only element. And surely in this particular case, as in many other areas, we have to judge looking at the way people give the answers, whether they themselves understand what is going on. And that's something, again, which is about the way we exercise our judgment. This is one of many, um, many areas in which we're looking at risk. The risk of things going wrong, we know on big projects that the stakes may be very high. Turning to number three about the relevant experience and knowledge. I've mentioned that I don't think most of us uh, approaching these have got the relevant experience and knowledge on big digital projects. And this is why, of course, we are potentially very vulnerable. It's not like it's the tenth time we've looked at a project of this kind. It's often the first. It's an uncharted territory. There are unknowns related to prediction and to technology and so on. Um, our experience may be in digital, but not necessarily this digital. And digital projects tend to be one off. And that's why this is a potential area of weakness for those who are exercising judgment. So I think what we have to do here again, looking at those who are presenting, is to be confident that they themselves have got the relevant experience or have gained the relevant knowledge from others to be able to give us, with confidence, a proposal. Now, it obviously helps hugely if, if you yourself are not, very tech savvy, if others on the board are, and you know, it's great to have those people there. But I come back to it, their tech savviness may not necessarily be absolutely relevant for this project. I've got a question here from uh, Solange about once you've asked these questions, how much does the dynamic of the board team impact the way deliberates these sessions? Isn't it the power at the team level versus any individual board member? Yes, I do, of course, agree with that. In that sense, I don't think digital is different from the many other aspects of the way in which we have to look at decision taking for big projects on the board. The dynamics of the board itself, of course, will be critical. And if there is a dominant individual, as ever, the danger is that the dominant individual carries the day, um, you know, and what he or she says is what everybody goes with. So, um, you know, that is also, I, I agree with that, but I think this is not particular to digital. I understand that uh, Chris is, um, is okay on the, on, the, uh, on the sound, but my sense is, should I go through and finish my presentation, then we go to Chris, is that, is that sensible? Uh, because I, I think, Switching backwards and forwards may not be quite the right way to do it here. So yeah, please go ahead. unless I'm prompted otherwise, I will, I will carry on. Is that okay, Chris? 
Yes, that's fine. Okay, fine. So I'll, I'll finish. I'm, I'm, I'm more than halfway through. Um, getting to the fourth question, which is about feelings and beliefs affecting the choice. So we are not going to approach this with a kind of empty mind. We, we will look at a project. We will look at the resources involved, the people, the money, and we will, we will approach it with feelings, inevitably, as we do any particular project. Um, one area of vulnerability is that people may be cautious about looking ignorant, feeling ignorant and looking ignorant, so they may not be willing to intervene as readily as they are due on something where the material is more accessible. And I think that is a source of potential danger, because I do think it's important if people don't understand or are very concerned about risk, that they should be encouraged, and the chairman plays a key role in this, encouraged to speak up. Um, this is part, perhaps, of the, of the notion of safe space. Are people generally on the board encouraged to speak up and to, to contribute to, to when they are, uh, you know, when there's a matter like this on the table? So, in a sense, digital is an extreme example often of the question of whether people feel safe in making comments. Number five is about the right options. That's to say the way the decision itself is taken. And here we've got the, you know, we've got the possibility that it's a go or a no go. And maybe this may be right, maybe it not. Maybe it may, it may actually be more sensible to say, let us get more information, let's do a pilot, you know, particularly if the stakes are large. And this, of course, would apply to any project. One wants to make sure that one's mitigated one's risk to the degree that's acceptable. It may not be possible. It may be, we've got to go with this. It's either go or no go. And that, of course, is completely understandable. Um, just a couple of things. Sometimes my experience is on, in, in this context, there's a kind of blackmail element. Blackmail in one of two ways. Either people say, look, we've spent six months researching this. We've done absolutely everything. And the implication of, so shut up, don't argue with us because we know what's going on and you don't. That's one kind of blackmail. And the other one is we've got to press ahead now because if we don't press ahead, then we'll have lost out to everybody else. You know, there's got to be a rush. Now, again, it's a matter of judgment to say, is this true? Do I believe this? I mean, it may be true, in which case there may be no option. Basically say we know we're going to take a risk, so we're going ahead. That's absolutely fine. But I think, again, one has to apply all the same criteria one would apply to a less abstruse issue to the area of, 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 the, of the digital area. Um, and, you know, more information, of course, is not necessarily always the right answer. One can be involved in analysis paralysis. I'm not suggesting that, but trading those off is about the question of mitigating risk. Finally, there's the question of can I deliver? And this, of course, is critical in, a, in this kind of project. It's not just a question of a notion of doing something. Uh, we've seen all too easily with COVID, people come around with ideas and then actually are unable to deliver them. I'm not naming any names here. Um, but I think, again, this is about establishing the credibility of the people involved and asking all those questions one would ask of any project in terms of delivery. Have we got the people? Have we got the resources? Have we got the wherewithal to deliver this? Not just, is it a great idea, which of course it always is. Um, you know, are our suppliers reliable? Are the, those are the kinds of issues the boards are familiar with and should be on the table. So these are my suggestions here about the kinds of ways one should approach the, the digital board agenda, as it were, to try and make sure one gets the right outcome. Now, we all know that the track record in this area is not good. Very many projects overrun, very many projects fail to achieve their potential. So I don't think I'm asking these questions, you know, in some kind of just fancy academic way. I know just how important these things are. Okay, so just, I said I mentioned in terms of the, um, the context of what I'm talking about, I wrote an, an article in the Harvard Business Review for January. There is the reference for it. Um, 
And you can see there the, the way in which I developed that judgment framework in the context of leadership, and I'm applying it to many different areas. And if you'd like to con continue the discussion, I'm only too happy to do so. I'm actively involved in researching this, and dialogue with practitioners is extremely welcome. Chris, can I come back to you with hope that your microphone has now been sorted out? Andrew, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my plan B here, uh, which is when your uh, first microphone doesn't work, you have to go for a plan B. So that, that was excellent. Uh, rather than going back to my slides, Andrew, what I'm going to suggest we do is basically cover some of the issues that you spoke to there uh, in terms of what's going on and about how we might handle them. And then, of course, we've had some questions already and take some more of those, if that's OK with you. So the, the, the first uh, area of the, the, the question I would like to kind of just look at a little bit is, is about uh, how much do we need to uh, transition the personnel on the board, if at all, in your view? Because uh, absolutely what you've uh, spoken to is a framework here for better understanding some of the challenges around digital. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the uh, composition of the board in terms of um, subject matter expertise? Typically a board has been made up of uh, compliance, uh, accounting, uh, maybe legal uh, experts. Uh, how much do you, do you think that uh, also bringing your framework in, but how much do you also think that we need to bring people with more uh, digital expertise on, let's say, like cyber uh, on, onto the board? Do you have a, a view on that? Yes, I do. Um, look, the ideal, without any question in, in my mind, is that everybody on the board should have sufficient knowledge to be able to approach these decisions with reasonable confidence, or if I can put it this way, with re enough confidence to feel able to ask questions, you know, not mm -hmm. feeling sort of cowed by the subject. That mm -hmm. must be the ideal. Now I'm on three boards at the moment, and two of these boards have got people on who are digital experts, and mm -hmm. they have been brought in for that reason. Now, in some ways, of course, it's very comforting for the rest of us to have such people there. But I come back to it, their digital knowledge may not always be relevant to what one's going in for. But mm -hmm. you know, often it's their confidence that, you know, that you know, they are able to ask the questions. And but I must also say that even if one is not confident oneself and not an expert, I come back to it. I do think, and I do it myself, I ask people before the meeting. What do you think of the paper? You know, I mean, is it okay? Are we going to be all right on this? You know, what do you think about page three? I do think that kind of uh, approach is something mm -hmm. that you know that helps. So, because I would say, ideally, everybody should. It's nice to have people who also have, but I think also as a board member, one has the responsibility to acquire that knowledge. And in terms of skills. That's something the chairman should be doing to saying to everybody, look, everybody, up your digital knowledge, up your ability to understand and think about these issues. Yes, yes. And, and that, that actually brings me very nicely to the, to the second area I want to speak to. Uh, we, we titled this um, series the, um, uh, the uh, chair of the future. And I just wondered, you, you were mentioning the chair there in terms of the role about encouraging the right questions around uh, setting the right agenda, but also uh, to your last point there about uh, actually ensuring uh, that better, everybody's up to speed. And again, I wondered what, what your uh, kind of personal view was in terms of the amount that the uh, uh, chair should actually structure uh, that digital um, expertise development for uh, NEDs, non-executive directors, or alternatively, actually, it should be down to the uh, non-executives themselves. Do you have a particular view about what the balance is there that's best in terms of actually bringing up the board to, to, uh, to be much more digitally savvy? I, I think it's both, actually. I mean, I think that, that, that you know, that all members have got a responsibility to upgrade their skills over time. But the chairman should be very aware of what is available around the table and should be encouraging each year 
uh, board members to, to acquire additional skills. So on one of the boards I'm on, every year we look at the skills, skill sets of the board, and we agree on what the uh, skills are that we're going to improve. But can I also say, I think the chairman is critical in this whole area. The chairman can help structure the discussion. The chairman creates safe space for people to say, look, I don't understand page three without feeling foolish. Um, the chairman is somebody who can help make sure that what happens before things get to the board are actually enable the board discussion to be more productive. So I do think the chairman is, as ever, really important. And you there? Yes. Um, Andrew? Yep, I, I can see you, I can hear you. Can you see and hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. So I, I just wondered on that um, uh, that point there, obviously uh, with your uh, connection at London Business School, uh, yeah. how much do you think that you can actually provide uh, digital uh, insights to board members through you know, programs like um, uh, that you may offer at London Business School? Well, Chris, if that's, a, if that's an invitation to advertise the London Business School, I'm only too happy to take it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, more generally, if I can put it this way, um, you know, business schools are one way in which one can acquire this kind of knowledge. Um, seminars and, you know, in, informal get-togethers of the board are other ways. And, you know, we do, we have, I mean, on many of the boards I'm, I'm on, have been on and I'm on now, we have briefing sessions, you know, outside the board to help us get up to speed. And, you know, that element is not, you don't necessarily have to acquire a huge amount of knowledge. You have to acquire enough to be able to confidently look at the, of the, of the papers and say, I think I know what the main issues are, or, you know, or I know somebody who's going to ask the right kind of question. It's that kind of confidence above all, I think one needs in a highly technical subject. Absolutely. I wonder the, that uh, in terms of actually the frequency of uh, activities that you may see um, in terms of the board decisions. Uh, there are so many issues now to be dealt with at board level, uh, often actually finding the time to uh, devote to uh, quite deep technical issues where you say you're looking at papers around uh, digital issues um, can mean that there isn't time in terms of actually being able to cover these in enough depth. Uh, I've seen one example of a major European chemical organization which has actually decided to um, have uh, two or three special digital board meetings focused purely on the digital issues uh, because they see them so big. Uh, and therefore, they've carved out extra time for their board members to do that, uh, to deal with those digital issues. I don't know if you've heard of an example like that before, if you've got any particular views on it, or you think that an agenda, a board agenda should stick together rather than trying to split out the digital issues uh, from, um, from what's there. Uh, I would, I'm cautious about the idea of a digital board, that's to say a, a meeting which deals with digital issues only. I mean, Digital is part of the way the company is run. And so for me, what I would like to do and suggest should be done if there are things that can't be taken up the board is either to have briefing meetings beforehand, one-to-one -one if necessary, groups if necessary, um, on the item which is coming up, more generally in terms of trends. I mean, I've, I've had one briefing session, for example, about the more digital trends in the industry and not just in, in our company. So I think there are quite a lot of ways here in which you can do it. But in essence, the big digital decision that comes to the board is no different from the big personnel decision that comes to the board or the big um, you know, marketing decision that comes to the board. Um, you know, the board is, is where finally things are decided. So I think the preparation is where the additional time should come, not a 
you know, 15 hour board meeting, whereas one can't quite cram everything in. out the digital piece you can actually kind of create um, almost if you want to call it the digital uh, bringing together uh, decisions which uh, need to be taken in the business context and our context and so we, we, we lose that kind of uh, 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 interconnect with the uh, organization. Um, Apologies, I think my uh, uh, signal is not so good at the moment. Um, I hope you can still hear me. Andrew? Yes, I can hear you fine. It's okay. So uh, the, the uh, other issue that uh, I wanted to uh, delve into a little bit was uh, actually about the uh, use of your framework across uh, the organization in terms of, uh, sorry, across the organization, across the board, about where you've seen uh, the framework used uh, in uh, good ways and in not so good ways. If we could just look at maybe a couple of examples that would uh, help us to start to think about the way that your framework can help us uh, with the digital uh, issues. Okay, so Chris, I mentioned in terms of the sort of not so good ways, the fact that there were sometimes dominant personalities um, who maybe everybody deferred to for one reason or another. Um, and they kind of dominated the agenda, not necessarily because they knew more than everybody else, but because that was the way the board dynamic worked. And that seems to me, again, that seems to be one area where things are not, not so good. Um, if I could take a second, it's, and it's, this is not just confined to digital, this is the way in which people's biases dominate their view of the agenda item. Now, I know of one company which requires people, it says, look, before you speak, you know, give us an idea of where you stand on this, just so that we're clear. And the chairman has, there has created a sufficiently uh, trusting atmosphere that people say, look, you know, I don't like the look of this. It seems to me, frankly, too risky. And I, that's how I approach this. And this ex that explains why. And having... Uh, Having biases actually on the table and admitted seems to me a sign of a strong board. It's one where mm -hmm. people feel confident enough to be able to talk about the way they feel about things. So that I would see as a, a good way of, of, of applying this, this, this framework. Um, in terms of trusting, um, boards rely hugely on people within the organization to explain to them what's going on. They are the filters for an enormous amount of information. And I think therefore, uh, the judgment framework in my view is also about saying, of applying for each board member to say, what do I make of this person? What do I make of this paper? I mean, I can tell you, I was on one board where every time I got presented to by one part of the organization, it was a selling proposition. It was as if I was a buyer and they were selling to me and it was really, really off-putting, you know, and they had not got the message that this was not a good way to convince the board. Instead of that, they should have allowed the board or at least perhaps given the board an illusion that they were making the choice and not the choice being made for them and the board rubber stamping. So that's another area in which I think you know, the judgment framework applies. Yes. Just to that point, we've got a question here from um, Charity, uh, who has asked, should there be an ethical uh, and legal representative to discern harmful biases? Uh, I assume that means within the boardroom. I don't know, Andrew, if you've got uh, any particular uh, view on that question. I think it's a, I think I've never seen that expert, that suggestion before, but I, I'm very excited by it. Very interesting idea. Let me tell yes. you, although I'm excited about it, I'm quite cautious about it. In one sense, surely this is the chairman's job. The chairman's job is to know within the room where people's biases are. Who is going to come out endlessly bullish about everything? Who is going to come and say, it'll never work? You know what I mean? The chairman should know about all those. In that sense, I think 
the chairman, in essence, should act on behalf of the board as the kind of ethical and legal representative. Um, I'm quite cautious about how such a person should operate as an independent entity on the board, but maybe I, I need to think about that. No, I, I think it's a fascinating issue. I mean, one of the things that uh, is uh, particularly challenging, particularly at the moment, is uh, within the code that is used by organizations, whether it's uh, machine learning code, things like that, the programmer can have certain biases which are within that code and therefore uh, uh, can go if you have millions of customers uh, across a very, very, very wide uh, kind of population. So there, there are challenges around uh, uh, how much bias actually comes into digital issues. Uh, and the kind of question is, you know, can can the board actually uh, uh, opine on that or influence uh, what's going on at uh, with a computer programmer uh, with it elsewhere within the organization? Yeah, look, I think um, if, I'm, if I've understood you right here, what I what I'm, think I'm hearing is, I mean, anything which comes out on the digital side, which involves programming, potentially has biasing, bias as part of the programming. I mean, that is yeah. a danger. And I think that's something which, you know, everybody on a board ought to be aware of, preferably ought to know about in a little bit more detail about how biases are introduced into programs. And so they don't just take programs as some magical black boxes. Now, you know, more sophisticated directors will not, of course, do that. But some who, again, who feel slightly scared about this may well feel, oh, you know, there's this very, you know, this is a thing here, um, you know, and this is what the program says. Well, there was a comedy series in which um, somebody at a counter used to report when everybody asked any question, used to report the mach you know, the computer says no. Well, the computer only says no, it's been programmed that particular way. So I do think that biases are, you know, are well, first of all, biases are quite likely and that this is an area of potential exploration. Mm -hmm. I just Cut out, Chris. I can't hear you at the moment. I don't know whether. Okay, Chris is frozen. Can you see me? Okay, folks. Am I? Am I okay? Yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> well, in that case, perhaps you know, if, if we perhaps deal with some some other issues while we're waiting to get Chris back. Um, any other any other questions anybody would like to raise? I don't know whether I've answered the ones on the way um, so far. Um, any other questions anybody would like to like to discuss on this? Um, perhaps I can just say a couple of things while if anybody's thinking about particular issues about artificial intelligence and um, within the within the uh, the process of, of looking at digital. Uh, propositions. So what I've been doing also is looking at the question of, is it possible for, um, for artificial intelligence, in essence, to exercise judgment? Um, in other words, can one get the machine to do one's judgment for one? And my conclusion is that um, machines are amazing in what they can do. And in some cases, notably in medicine, they have it's been demonstrated that they are better than human beings at doing a number of things um, but actually one is relying on human beings to program to train for data to input data and to interpret the results and so when we're talking here about um, about artificial intelligence as part of the digital offering as it were i don't think it's um, I don't think it's true that AI itself can exercise judgment. And my, I'm making that comment based on looking at the sort of philosophical underpinnings as well as the technical ones on the question of what differentiates a human being from a machine. I'm not going to bore you with the detail of that, but 
that's roughly speaking what I've been doing to try and answer this question. Uh, Charity, you suggest that um, AI can be programmed to have biases. I, you're absolutely right. And I think we've seen, for example, in the case of selection, uh, sometimes that programs weed out people on the basis of some kind of uh, some kind of bias. Um, we've seen that uh, biases exist, for example, rather worryingly in the case of parole for prisoners. If you mean, in that the programming itself has proved to be to be biases. Um, but as a matter of interest, too, you 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 know you talk about humans having having biases. This is one reason. Chris, are you back? Are you back with us? Okay, fine. All right. Okay. Not to worry. Do you do you want to go to your things you want to discuss, or do you want to carry on this line? What would you like? And cover a couple more issues. Uh, given uh, we've got sure. the technical issues, uh, if that's okay, I, I will. Yeah. Um, uh, if I if I can do. Um, so I, if I if I could ask you um, um, in terms of the um, your framework, particularly in terms of um, as we get towards the end of it, number five, uh, and you ask about the issue around are these the right options? Um, yeah. How do you, do you see the board uh, evaluating the options? Obviously, particularly around. Uh, digital because they are now uh, both very expensive and I think as you mentioned earlier on uh, very very um, uh, large projects often dealing with data and, and significant parts of the organization so as, as a um, board director and certainly again using your personal experience uh, how, how would you see about trying to evaluate if the organization does have the, the right set of options in terms of making the decisions Okay, so I come back here to the sequencing, which is thinking about it. Mm -hmm. In general, we kind of know when a, a big digital decision is coming onto the agenda. You know, people have often been working on these for a very long time, and everybody's waiting for the March board meeting or the June board meeting in order to make the big mm -hmm. decision. So again, I think it's the, the job, both of the chairman, but also I think the company secretary has got a very big role potentially to play here in making sure that in the preparation for that critical decision, those who are going to make the decisions are well placed to do so. So my view would be that um, the choice when it comes should not be a kind of free for all or, as I said, an endless board meeting, you know, which end of five hours exhaustive discussion. People basically say, I don't care what the decision is as long as we made one. At the end of this, mm -hmm. you know, we're also exhausted. We can't go on any longer. Um, people have got to be pretty clear-headed about this, especially granted that the stakes may be incredibly high. If I just think back to some of the IT disasters that have been, I can remember in the UK the TSB Bank uh, made a made a decision to make a transition, uh, a digital transition, which I mean virtually wrecked the company. I mean this was really really bad. I mean, granted, the stakes are so high for these big decisions. I don't think one can prepare too much for a decision of this kind. And when it arrives, people ought, people ought, and the one test at the end of it is, do people feel, actually, we looked at the right issues, the process by which we did it round the table made good sense that we would be proud to demonstrate this to others and actually we gave it our best shot there's no guarantee this is that it will go right digital decisions have are full of risk full of risk there's no guarantee but my I, you know what i've been looking for in trying to provide this judgment framework is to say how do you stack the cards in your favor? That I hope mm -hmm. is what it can do. Yeah, 
I, I could just following up on the point there in terms of the right options and what you were just saying there in terms of uh, uh, both countering the, the, the five-hour board meeting and let's just get to a decision uh, and, and also the, um, uh, the importance you mentioned, the, the UK bank there. Uh, is it important or um, more and more than important, but the, the, the role of the chair really to actually impress upon the board members that particularly when dealing with digital issues because of their scale, because of the pace of the way that technology um, is moving, that those decisions are almost even more important um, than, than a typical business decision. Uh, and therefore, you know, they, they, they need to be considered in, in the right way as you're, you're talking about. So uh, is the, the role of the chair the one that's absolutely kind of critical in terms of actually ensuring that those are the right options that are being, are being followed? To, to my original question, if you see what I mean. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I say when I talk about boards more generally and about board meetings, I, I, I use the phrase, you know, board meetings are won or lost before the meeting starts. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. strongly of the view that what happens at the board meeting, you know, I mean, is should not be the critical and deciding factor because one should have, you know, got the preparation, got things in order in such a way as one has a pretty good chance of getting the best of the people round the table. I mean, I have sat in so many board meetings, you know, where people who had something to say said nothing. And those who had nothing to say said an awful lot. You know I mean? And that again comes back to the role of the chairman, who I believe should be someone who says to the, to the verbose, you know, thank you very much. I think we've got your point. And should bring in the silent, who the chairman knows has got something to say. So I do think I'm agreeing with you, Chris, that the chairman is really the kingpin in this. And, and, and I wonder whether or not we could just close with, with, with two questions uh, on that area, actually, just um, from what you were just mentioning there. I suppose the first is uh, around the chair and the role of the chair. The second would be around the actual role of the, um, the director themselves, not an executive director. And I, let's just turn to that one first in terms of the... Um, the question that you almost pose, which is, can I deliver uh, as a as a non uh, non executive director in in that kind of context? So, I just wondered if you had any any thoughts about, you know, the, the uh, looking in the mirror, I suppose, about actually kind of, um, you know, do you as the non executive director have the skills in order to kind of add what you need to add to that very robust discussion in the boardroom around very big digital decisions and. That, in a way, is the ultimate question, isn't it? And I just wondered if you had any, any thoughts on that as one of the closing, closing issues that we might cover here. Well, Chris, I think that, you know, the, the, the non-executive director who thinks that he or she knows absolutely everything, you know, is potentially a bit of a menace. Um, I think one, one should be humble and understand that one doesn't know everything. But the way in which one approaches something should be, as it were, to say, have I really understood? Am I able to make an informed choice? And, you know, am I able, if I've got niggling doubts about something, am I able to bring these niggling doubts out, even though everybody seems to think it's okay? I mean, I do have, again, I do have experience of where chairman have said, look, everybody seems to be in agreement you know what I mean? Is there any anything we should be anything we should be aware of before we go ahead with it? Just to be clear, not at a sort of procrastinating, but just to make sure that what has been discussed is not just the group thing, as it were, that this has turned into, but or perhaps bring up something him or herself. So I think that's a really important role um, in terms of in terms of the, again what the chair can do to get the best out of the non-executives. Great. And, and I, um, uh, just with the last few minutes here, I just want to know the final question here. It, it seems to have come up quite a few times, uh, the role of the chair. Uh, and if we look ahead, if we take the medium-term view over the next five or 10 years, there are some pretty tumultuous issues facing business from climate change to digital to 
to COVID to, to geopolitics, um, thinking about the US election today. Um, and they're pretty uh, weighty issues. And so with that medium term, looks like it's uh, an era of, of change and, and, and flux. Uh, and one where uh, businesses have got to be on their toes in order to survive and prosper. Uh, and I just wondered if you had any closing thoughts on the chair uh, as really uh, helping kind of navigate uh, that very kind of challenging uh, landscape that I've set out, uh, not only in the context of, of, of digital, but you know, in the in the broader context as well. If you if you would, in terms of a few closing remarks. Uh, yes, well, Chris. I, I I mean, again, my sense is. Look, boards can be responsive, basically. They can get what comes onto the agenda as sent by the chief executive and the executives, and they can say, all right, so we're dealing with the business. Again, my view is a good board is one that anticipates issues. It doesn't just respond to issues, but says, this is, an error, this is something coming over the horizon, as it were. Do we have a view on this? Should we be thinking about it? It's rather like, you know, if you like, the budget comes and it hasn't got something really important in. So it's when a board agenda doesn't just look forward, it also looks at what's coming up over the horizon. I'm sorry, that's my phone ring. I should ignore it. Um, you know, and that what's coming over the horizon, I think, is just as important for the board agenda as responding to the needs of the moment. And and in and and in terms of the the chair's role, I suppose in terms of those things coming out of the horizon, that they're, they're probably well, I don't know. Do you do you see them as being more significant over the next sort of five years plus, um, uh, and therefore uh, requiring the chair to be even more kind of vigilant about those things coming over the horizon? There was some philosopher, Chris. I, I think it was Santayana who said. Um, you know, as Adam said to Eve, my dear, we live in an age of transition. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think we've always had big issues on the agenda. I can remember all the way through my life, things have seemed big. Uh, you know, of course, you know, we, we, we are dealing with huge issues right now. But I don't have a sense that, you know, we are necessarily living in, in more turbulent. We like to think we're living in more turbulent times than ever. But that's a phrase I've heard many times in my lifetime. So I think that the, the chair, it's the chair's job. I, I reckon it's the chair's job to make sure what's relevant is on the board agenda. Andrew, that is, um, is fantastic and uh, an excellent point to finish with. Uh, and um, that one where um, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground here from corporate governance to uh, Adam and Eve, I think. So. Uh, quite um, uh, extraordinary uh, afternoon. Uh, thank you for everybody for, for joining us. Thank you, Andrew, for presenting. Uh, please see you here.